All right, this morning we're going to talk about Old Testament law versus New Testament liberty. Notice I did not say law versus grace because, you know, that's people say we're under grace now. Well, technically we were always under grace. You know, you go back the whole way through the Bible, back under the law, back before the law, God always had a measure of grace for man. So, you know, I'm not going to argue about that whole thing, but I want to talk today about law versus liberty. Uh, first, we're going to start out with the Old Testament law. Turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 1. Genesis is basically the story of how God created the earth, and then God created man, and uh, how He gave man a free will to basically do what He wanted to do. And man chose to sin and do all sorts of evil things, pretty much like today. And you had the flood in the days of Noah, and after the flood you had the three sons of Noah, which are the three races, the three basic races, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they kind of went their separate ways. And Shem, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, that was a prophecy Noah gave. And he fathered the, his descendants became the Jewish people as well as the Indians and the Orientals. Um, but the Jewish people, they go up through, and you have the whole story of them through Genesis. And then Exodus... You have them basically going into captivity in Egypt. You can read the story there. We're not going to get into it. But then Exodus is when they, the Exodus, when they leave Egypt. And Egypt is given as a type of the world. So God's people are to leave the world. But they leave and they go out into the wilderness and then they go into the promised land. And while they're in the wilderness, God says, okay, Moses, you're the one who's heading up these people. I'm going to give you some laws to dictate how things are to be done. And you read these laws, and a lot of times you think, man, that's really tough, that's really a hard thing. Well, I can tell you, if you read all the all the laws in the book of Leviticus, they're all actually good. There's no thing like, you're not, thou shalt not smile, thou shalt not sleep at night, you know, or something. It's all positive. We look at it and go, oh, those laws, they were really hard and everything. Well, maybe a little bit, but... They were actually positive. But I'm going to show you some of this here this morning. Okay, chapter 5. We're going to start at verse, at verse 1. It says here, And if a soul sin, and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if a soul touch any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or a carcass of an unclean cattle, or of unclean cattle, excuse me, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touch the uncleanness of man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whether or whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and if it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then he shall be, be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he hath sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin." And if he be not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed, two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And he shall bring them unto the priest, which shall offer that which is for the sin offering first, and wring off his head from his neck, but shall not divide it asunder. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar, for it is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner, and the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. Now before we continue here this morning, I have to just take a couple minutes here, because we had members of the congregation sin this week, so i got to go out and kill the uh, animals that they brought for the to forgive their sins. You say, what are you talking about? 
Well, the Bible, I believe the Bible teaches the same gospel from cover to cover. I believe that there's no dispensations. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> I, I've heard this. I mean, it, you know, there's there's this you know guy, I'm going to cut on him again because he deserves it, this little punk Steve Anderson down south, and he has a lot of followers. And he says, we are non-dispensational. It's a lie. <laughs> you have to be dispensational. You aren't going to bring an animal to be sacrificed for your sins. Don't be ridiculous. There are different dispensations within the Bible. It's right there. It's a plain teaching of Scripture. Nobody's going to follow that these verses back here. Why? Because that system has been done away with. They weren't in sin doing what they were doing back here. They were doing what God told them to do. Okay, the Lord is giving these laws to Moses. He's saying, this is what I want you to do. And that's what they had to do back then. But I want to show you a couple of things here. You'll notice there in verse 1, and if a soul sin. It does not say if a man sin. It says a soul. Well, why is that? Well, because back in your Old Testament, the soul was connected to the flesh. So when your flesh would sin, and if you look down there, uh, verse 2, if a soul touch any unclean thing, well, how can your soul touch something? Well, back in the Old Testament, when it was connected to your flesh, it could touch something. If you touch something with your flesh, your soul was also touching it. That's why you were unclean. And you can read about some of the, the uh, hygiene-type laws in the book here of Leviticus, and there's this thing of you touch this, well, you'll be unclean for seven days, and you're to wash yourself so many times and go to the priest and all this different stuff. Why? Well, because their souls and their flesh were joined. That doesn't exist anymore. And we're, we're going to look at that here in just a little bit. But another thing you need to understand here from this portion of Scripture is that God required a continuous, continually sacrificing of sin, or sacrificing of animals to pay for sins. Is that the system that we have today? No. Jesus paid for your sins once on the cross. And I had a guy, the one time, a Methodist pastor from down south, I got into an argument with him at a gas station <laughs> and he he said that it he said you believe that that all your sins past present and future are forgiven and i said absolutely jesus paid it all on the cross and he said that's heresy that's what he told me that's heresy it's like no that's bible doctrine <laughs> you know but if you're self-righteous you know want to add a little bit of your own works to it well i guess it would seem heretical to you all right and you say, well, why were they doing these things back here? You know, weren't they looking forward to the cross? <laughs> no, Jesus didn't die on the cross yet. In fact, the cross system of execution there, the Roman system of execution, didn't even exist at that point in time. Now you can see prophecies back in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, God Himself shall provide a lamb for the sacrifice. You know that the prophecy given there. There's a lot of prophecies, you know, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. The Lord God would come from the bloodline of Shem. There's a lot of prophecies that are given that point to Jesus Christ, but they didn't know about it. And you hit the New Testament, there, you know, Jesus says, I'm going to have to be crucified. And they're all going, huh? What? What are you talking about? They didn't know about it. Why? They were following this system here. And by the way, what happened when Jesus was born? What did Joseph and Mary do? They took two turtle doves to the priest. Why? They were in the Old Testament. You say, well, no, they're in the New Testament. The book, no. They're in a collection of books called the New Testament. So you got to get that stuff figured out. And that's why you, know, you hear Christians say, well, the Bible contradicts and, and there's some gray areas in Scripture. No, the, the Bible does contradict if you don't rightly divide it. You know, you rightly divide the word of truth. Now, was this system a tough system to live under? Yes and no. Exodus chapter 35. Go back one book there. Exodus chapter 35. I'm going to show you one of the quote-unquote tough things here. Exodus chapter 35, verse 1. <clears throat> and Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them. Okay? commanded six days shall work be done but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day a sabbath of rest to the lord 
Whosoever doeth work therein shall surely fall from God's good graces. No, it says, shall, shall surely be put to death. Is there anything like that in the Pauline epistles? No. These people that say you have to keep the Sabbath day, you, you can't do any work at all, these Seventh-day Adventist types, I guarantee you that they do work on the Sabbath day. I knew one the one time. I used to work with a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was wicked. I mean, just fornicating drunkard. I mean, the guy was, he was very wicked. But he, I won't come into work on a Saturday. No, I can't work on a Saturday. That's, no, I can't do that and everything. But then you'd hear about it, and he'd be like, yeah, I went to a bar with me and my girlfriend, went to a bar and everything. Did you get gas for your car? You know? Were you, uh, were you keeping the Sabbath day holy there? You know, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord? You know? These guys are working on the Sabbath day. Why aren't they being put to death? I mean, hey, you're going to keep the commandment. Do the whole thing. But look here at verse 3. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. I wonder how many Seventh-day Adventists don't eat. That's what's being talked about there. Kindling of fire to cook on it. I wonder how many of them say, I'm not going to eat on Saturday. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, if they actually followed the Old Testament law, there wouldn't be any of them left. They'd be killing, you know, getting killed all the time. This is not for your, for a Christian today. So was that a tough commandment? Yeah, it was actually. Numbers chapter 15. You say, well, did that ever happen? You know, did it ever happen that some somebody worked on the Sabbath day? Numbers chapter 15. Man, I messed up that reference. Verse 32 is where we start at, but I have verse 32 to verse 26. <laughs> so I guess we have to read backwards. It's verse 36. All right. Oh, man, I really try for infallibility, but I guess I mess up sometimes. Uh, verse, for, verse 32. Numbers 15, verse 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Remember what it said back there in Exodus 35, verse 1 through 3? You're not to kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. Why was he gathering sticks? To kindle a fire. Verse 33. And they found, and they that found him gathering sticks brought him into, unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. Kind of like they put him in a little prison type of thing. Verse 35, And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely, or shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Pretty tough system. Death penalty for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. Why? It's what the Lord commanded. Okay, and the Lord didn't say, well, hey, I commanded it back then, and then they kind of you know, did it or something else. No, it says there in verse 35, the Lord said unto Moses, kill him. So it was kind of a tough thing. But uh, was there a way to get around some of it? Was it also kind of weak? Turn in your New Testament to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. I'm going to show you that, yes, while the law was tough in some ways, it was also weak. You know, people have this idea that if you could go back under the law and have all these laws put on you, that it would just turn you into this holy, sanctified creature that wouldn't sin, not so. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? We just read it. You're not to work on the Sabbath day. Oh, he's doing work? Okay, kill him. That's the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, now look at this, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The Lord looked down and He said, 
these fleshly people, they can't keep the law. You know, it's not going to happen. So Jesus Christ had to come down and live his life in the flesh, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and yet he never sinned. And then he died as the perfect sacrifice, the one time only perfect blood sacrifice to pay for our sins so we don't have to worry about this thing of continually, you know, I sinned again and, you know, I got to go do the sacrifice and everything. But on that point, the reason that the Old Testament law was weak according to the flesh, I want you to think about something. If you touch this or you curse or whatever, you have to go, go and take this young bullock to be sacrificed or this turtle dove or whatever. Well, now what could you do? What you could do is you could sin and then go to the priest and say, here's the sacrifice. Hey, I'm free. The next day comes along. I'm going to sin again here. Hey, get the turtle dove ready. I'm going to be going to the priest soon. You know, and you go and you sin and then you go to the priest again. Sounds yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. The auricular confession with the Roman Catholics. Oh, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Why? Well, I was out drunk and fornicating last night. Going to probably do it again next week, but what do I got to do? Well, put a little bit of money in the in the till or whatever, you know. We'll say a mass for you. Or, you know, yeah. See? You can abuse a system of law and payments that you can make. If you got enough money, you can live a life of sin. And that's what the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' day. They were just living in sin all the time, but then they'd go and they'd do the sacrifice and they'd say, I'm blameless. And they were, according to the Old Testament law. They were using the law to their advantage. All right, That's why it was weak according to the flesh. Now we're going to see a good example of this. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 26. If you want to see a, a good book in your Bible, King James Bible that describes modern day America almost to a, a T, read the book of Jeremiah sometime. I'm going to start here, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 26. For among my people are found wicked men. <laughs> Do we have that among Christians today? Amen. Yeah. They lay wait as he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. <laughs> you know, you get a guy like like uh, Joe Osteen or, or Rick Warren, you know, those guys overpass the deeds of the wicked. There are wicked lost people out in the world that are ten times more ethical and more moral than those men are. Some of these faith healer guys are so crooked and corrupt, they they steal from old women. They look down in the crowds and they see old women in a, in a wheelchair or old men over there on a, with a cane and they go, I wonder how much money they have on them. <laughs> They're disgusting. Just rotten. But we'll continue on here. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Wonderful and horrible. Look at this. Verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Yeah, the Old Testament, there's no application to today. I mean, yeah, the prophets prophesy falsely. You know, the priests bear rule by their means. I'm the head of this corporation. <laughs> I'm in it for the money. And what? what's the whole thing there? My people love to have it so. You know why there's mega churches? Because the people want it that way. The people in those mega churches, they don't want a preacher up there preaching to them the truth. They know they're being lied to. They know they're being conned. And they're willing to pay for it. Oh, our preacher makes $100,000 a year. Oh, that's wonderful. He's a wonderful man. Because he tells me that I'm a good person. You know, I was going to do, a, originally I was going to do a sermon today on Joel Olstein, Your Best Life Now. And I didn't, I was trying to find the book here locally. Couldn't find it. Had to order it online. 
so it won't be probably till next week now. But people want that syrupy garbage mm-hmm. that that man pours out. He can fill football stadiums. And the guy's worth millions and millions of dollars, and the people know it. And they want it to be that way. So, But, you, but going back to the, the purpose of this sermon here, these people are under the law. And you can see that they're abusing the system. Why? They are waxing fat, they shine. Uh, therefore they are become great and waxing rich. They're wealthy. You know, hey, you know, there's you can see like this all this paying off stuff going on, you know. <laughs> kind of like modern day America. You know, uh, oh, well, you know, here, I'll give you some money. We'll just kind of look the other way, you know. Yeah, I just, you know, stole from this corporation over here. Well, we just, you know, had a corporate takeover here and we just ripped this person off. We cheated on our taxes. We all this stuff, and, and the priests are going, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, just, you know, bring your sacrifice in. Yep, you know, just like today. Exactly like today. So was the law a tough system to work on or to live under? Yeah, when they were doing it right. But was it also an occasion to the flesh? Absolutely. So it wasn't that the Lord came down and, and brought in this new system where everybody's kind of weak or something. No. The law itself was weak. According to the flesh. Now, what happened to this old system, Old Testament system, after Jesus died on the cross? Colossians chapter two. I'm going to show you what happened to it. Colossians chapter two. We're going to start at verse eleven. Now, if you remember what we read earlier here at the beginning of this message, we talked about how that the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. It, you know, in your Old Testament, over and over and over again, it says about the soul. Okay? Now look what happens here in the New Testament. Verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses there. Okay, look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary, uh, or that was, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now what happened there? Well, when you get saved, this body of flesh that you have, the soul that's inside you, is cut loose from your flesh. So you have back there in the Old Testament, the, the flesh, when your flesh would touch something unclean, when the flesh would do something unclean, then it affected the soul. Not so anymore. That's how you can have eternal security right now in this dispensation. You can have eternal security. Why? Well, because having forgiven you all trespasses. What you do in the flesh will not affect your soul. It will affect, affect your rewards in that sense, yes. You won't, it will not affect your eternity, is what I should clarify that. You know, if you live in the flesh, if you sin in the flesh, it, you will die, you know, you will have problems. Okay, but it's not in the same sense as it was back there in the Old Testament. You aren't going to lose your soul because of what you've done in your flesh. Now, let me just explain real quick here the difference between the flesh and the soul and the spirit. Okay, it's been likened to a football, we'll say. All right, it's a very good analogy. What do you have with a football? Well, the outside is made of what? Leather. Okay, it's at least the real ones are, you know. They have other ones that are plastic. But the point is, the, the outside is flesh. Okay, now what do you have on the inside? That outside couldn't hold the air in because it's porous. It has, you know, wouldn't be able to hold the air. So on the inside of that uh, leather, you have rubber, a layer of rubber. That would be like your soul. And in the inside of that, you have air, which is like your spirit. So not a perfect representation of, of man, but you know, body, soul, and spirit, but it's, you can see it there. Now, when you get saved as a Christian, 
your soul is cut loose from your flesh. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about touching things and now you're unclean and all this other stuff. Now, what we had there back in the Old Testament, when you had the soul touching things and now it's unclean, you didn't have eternal security back then. All your sins were not forgiven back then, as we just saw here in this study. In the New Testament, all your sins are forgiven. So then, what happens when a Christian starts to do things that God doesn't really care for? Well, that's where liberty comes in. God can't just say, hey, I said I'm going to seal you till the day of redemption and, and I've forgiven you all trespasses, but you just sinned there so sorry, you just lost your salvation. God can't do that. That would go against his promises. So what does he have? Now he has liberty. You know, we've kind of talked about this before. It's like a police officer pulls you over because you were speeding and he says you disobeyed the law, but I realize that you're on your way to the hospital because your wife is going into labor, so I'm going to have some liberty for you. In fact, I'm going to take you and I'll, you know, give you a police escort into the hospital there. I'll speed along with you, you know. That's somewhat of what's going on here. The Lord says, okay, I realize you have eternal security. Your sins are totally forgiven. So now I'm going to have some liberty for you. Some of those things that the we're going to see about this, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but the, the things of the Old Testament where you're not allowed to touch this, you're not allowed to taste that, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, now you're allowed to because God has to have a system of liberty there. But let's continue here. Look at verse 16. It says here, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So in other words, you're not to be judged on certain things. You know, I'm not going to kick the whole thing of, of holidays or holy days again, but there are a lot of Christians that will judge based on people celebrating a holy day. They're violating that scripture right there. It's not a major issue. It's not a major doctrine. It is an issue of liberty. And we're not to judge each other over issues of liberty. But uh, let's continue here. Look at uh, verse 20. Jump down there. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, see, we talked about it earlier, some of those laws back in the Old Testament. I mean, look at, think of the things that we talked about. You're not to touch any dead, unclean animal. Is that a bad thing? No. <laughs> you really don't want to make that a habit of going around touching dead animal hides or something. Your, your carcasses, you know, rotten animal laying there. What about swearing? Well, you're not really to do that either. Profanity, but then there's also the thing of swearing of oaths. It's a bad idea. So those things do have a degree of, okay, they're all right. They, you, you should use those for instruction in righteousness. You know, the Levitical law, there's a lot of things back there, bathing your flesh in, running water, a lot of those types of things. But to, to try and take them, and now you have to live under that. Right. To go back under the law, yeah, you're going to have some trouble. And we're not supposed to do that. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Back a couple books, Galatians chapter 3, verse 4. Now what happened here, uh, again, you know, right now, most Christians, uh, the body of Christ the, that's living on the earth right now is predominantly Gentile. There are some saved Jews out there. But in the first century, it was predominantly saved Jews. They were the, the majority of the saved people in the first century when the Bible is being written. They're Jewish. And what was happening is they're seeing Gentiles getting saved and they're coming in and these, these Jews just came out of the Old Testament system. So the ideas of liberty are still very new to them. Okay? And so the Jews are kind of like struggling when, you know, okay, what do we give up here? What do we do? You know, how do we deal with these Gentiles? But then they were actually false brethren. Jews that were not truly Christian converts that were coming in and trying to get these Gentiles to live after 
the manner of the Jews. That's what it says here. Galatians chapter... No, I wrote that wrong. Galatians chapter 2. I'm sorry. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Okay, it says here, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, what's that mean there, verse 5? To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Paul is, not, is saying, we didn't even give these people an hour to talk to us. Just like, get, get out of here. Yeah, but we're trying to get out. <laughs> okay, that's how you're to deal with heretics that come in and try to mess you up doctrinally. Get out. No, you know, well, you need to respect my opinions. No, I don't. Get out. <laughs> but you see there, they tried to bring them into bondage. How do you bring somebody into bondage? Through the law, not through liberty. So you got to watch out for that thing. Somebody trying to get you back under the law. And this, this modern uh, Messianic Jew thing, that's what they try to do. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Now we're going to look at Christian liberty. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Here you have something that you need to remember. This is another one of those very important verses that you should have memorized. All right, it says here, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Well, there are certain things that you can't do as a Christian. There are certain things that you aren't allowed to do. It's not what it says there. It says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All right, we're going to see another the occurrence of this. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse twenty-three. First Corinthians ten twenty-three. Here you have it repeated, but slightly different. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, what does the word expedient mean? We'll kind of compare it to the thing of speed. All right, if you have to get to work. And you get in your car and you say, you know, i got to get to work on time. What do you want to do? You want to get to work as quickly as possible without anything slowing you down. Well, how would it be if you said, well, you know, i got to get to work, but I think I'm going to chain this uh, 16-foot log to the back of the car. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Is that expedient? No. <laughs> yeah, not when your transmission falls out. No, it's, it's, not, ex it's not expedient. It wouldn't be expedient. Now, as a Christian... You're going through your life and you want to witness for Jesus and you you know I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ and I want to live for the Lord. But you take these fleshly carnal ordinances and you chain them onto yourself and now you're dragging all this other stuff along, you know. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and also you have to wear this certain type of clothing and you have to dress this certain type of way and you can't listen to this and you can't watch that and you can't touch not, taste not, handle not. You're dragging all this luggage behind you. Is that expedient? No, it's not expedient. And look at the other one there. All things edify not. Did you know one of your jobs as a Christian, you have the thing of the ministry of reconciliation to the lost world, but you also have a responsibility to the saved Christians to edify them, to build up the brethren. You see a brother or sister in Christ that's, that's hurting or they're, they're a little bit off doctrinally or whatever, you're to go over to them in Christian charity and help them. You're to edify them. Now, when you start to fight over issues of liberty, is that edifying to the brethren? No. No, yeah. no it's not. It's carnal. Look at verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Can you glorify God with what you're doing in your life? That's what you need to ask yourself. Whenever you hit some kind of a thing that's an issue of liberty, should I do this or should I do that or should I watch this or should I watch that, can you glorify God with what you're going to do? That's the standard for a Christian. Now we're going to look at some Christian issue, or Christian liberty issues. What about appearance? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 
It says here, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a sin unto him? Are you following along in your Bible? Yeah. You better be, because I just lied. <laughs> okay? Not intentionally. Well, I guess it was intentional. I, I just wanted to, to try and get to you. It doesn't say it is a sin unto him. It says it is a shame unto him. Did you know God looks down when a man has a woman's hairstyle, long hair? So they're right there. If a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. God looks down and he goes, man, I can't believe he's looking like that. Looks, you know, it's, that's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, the Bible says back in Revelation that we are created for God's pleasure to bring him glory and honor. But it doesn't say that it's a sin. You say, well, then a man can have long hair. I didn't say that. Well, then a man can't have long hair. It's a sin to have long hair. I didn't say that either. You know, I know a story of a guy. I said this at Bible study Thursday night. There was a guy that would grow his hair long and then cut it so he could give it to these, these kids that, you know, need wigs or whatever. Locks these of love, I think. Locks of love or something it's called. Yeah. You know, and people say, oh, that's a wonderful thing. You know, would you do that? No, I wouldn't. Sorry, I'll leave that up to women or something, you know. I'm not going to grow my hair long for a thing like that. I think it's a nice thing that the guy's trying to do, but I don't want to look, have the Lord look at me and say, boy, that's a shame, you know. Is the guy sinning then? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say it was a sin. I just said it's a shame. I'll give you another good one. And this is another one. This will be fun to say. What about a man with a beard? <laughs> I have some brethren that say I'm carnal and worldly because I have a beard. And you know what? I know some of the brethren that say that men that shave their faces are sodomites. I actually heard that. I actually heard a guy say that, you know, he went really off on this whole thing. And there are verses in the Old Testament, by the way, where like uh, David's servants the one time went someplace and they shaved off half their beard and they wouldn't go out until their beard grew back, you know? Why? Well, it's an Old Testament Jewish thing there, you know. Okay, more of a cultural thing. But I knew I'd, this guy took that and he said that if you study it, if you research it out, men that shaved their faces in the past were all sodomites because they were trying to look like women with a smooth face. Come on. See, what's going on there? You have a Christian making a issue of liberty into major doctrine. You know, and we have it around here. We have the Amish. And we have some, you know, the Mennonites a lot of times will shave their faces, but you have the Amish and some of the other old order sects, and there's so many little sects of Martinite, Mennonite, uh, Beachy, Amish, Amish, you know, all these little things. Charity ministries. Charity ministries. And, you know, you have all these little sects out there, and some of them they have beards, and some of them it's a beard without a mustache, and some, you know, you have to grow it a certain length, and whatever. What's going on? It's a bunch of carnal people fighting over issues of liberty. Okay? So what's the Bible really teach? Neither. If a man has a beard, fine. If a man decides to shave off his beard, absolutely fine. No problem. Whatever. Don't fight over issues of liberty. Now look at verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Well, then a woman with short hair is of the devil. She's bobbed hair and bossy women. and You know, there is a book out there, actually, that's bobbed hair and bossy women. I think it's uh, John R. Rice wrote it, I think. You know, and they, they talk about a woman with short hair, you know, and she's of the devil and all this stuff. It doesn't say that, you know. It just simply says, hey, if a man has long hair, it's a shame. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her. Okay? Have a feminine hairstyle. The Lord's not going to be upset. I don't think a woman ought to have a, a buzz cut or anything, you know, or, or shave her head or something like that. I think that's a shameful thing. But again, is it a sin? No. It just it doesn't look good. <laughs> you know, and the Lord kind of looks down and goes, oh boy, you know, it's not too good. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. 
says here, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Well, brother, a woman has to wear a dress or a skirt. A woman in pants is a sin and abomination. Does it say that? No. I don't see the term dress or pants in there. It says modest apparel. That's what it says. Well, you say, well, then a woman can wear pants and wear tight jeans and stuff like that. I didn't say that. It doesn't say that there. It says modest apparel. It's immodest. Well, then a woman, you know, every kind of dress out there or every kind of skirt is modest. I didn't say that either. There are some of these Mennonite girls in this area, and they wear these skin-tight dresses that go down, you know, down like past their knees, and then it kind of flares out, you know, and like they're kind of like barely walking, you know, barely can move their legs. It's a good thing we don't have grizzly bears in the area because they could never outrun one, you know. <laughs> it's It's absurd. Oh, but she's modestly dressed. She's got a dress or a skirt on. Yeah, but it's immodest. The Bible says modest apparel. Okay? That's what it says. But there are brethren that will fight and divide over this issue. Now, our standard here at Bible Believers Fellowship is we prefer dress and skirts for women. Okay? Are we going to force it? No. If a sister wants to come to this fellowship here and she's wearing modest pants, not skin tight like she was they're painted on or something. I mean, you know, loose pants. Okay, fine. Come on in. If at some point in time you get under conviction and you say, you know what, I want to do this thing for the Lord, and that's what it's supposed to be, by the way. Don't if you're a woman and you and you listen to this ministry, you're part of this ministry, and you say, I'm gonna wear a dress or a skirt because Brian told me to do it. No, don't do that. It has to be a standard between you and the Lord. And if you are, as a Christian woman, you look and you say, yeah, you know what? I think the modest, the most, the best way for me to be modest before the Lord is to wear a dress or a skirt. And I don't care what the world thinks. I'm doing this for the Lord. That's the right standard. That's the right one. But are we going to fight and divide over this issue? No. Absolutely not. Okay, now what about entertainment? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. It's a short verse, very easy to, re to remember. It says here, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now a lot of brethren will say, well then this means no television or movies at all for any reason ever. So is that what it says? It says abstain from all appearance of evil. There are some old movies, there are some old shows, and you know, you gotta be careful. I'm not endorsing anything, everything that's out there, but you know, weigh it out. There are some old things out there that are not evil. Alright? Weigh that stuff out as a Christian. You say, well, what happens if I watch an R rated movie or something? Well, you're gonna defile your mind, but you're not gonna lose your salvation. Okay? You say, well, alright, then Brian says I can watch R rated movies. I didn't say that. You know, I'm not endorsing it. I'm saying the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. But are we going to condemn people to hell because we catch them watching a movie or something like that? No. I'm just going to say, man, you know, you're going to have a hard time walking with the Lord if you make a steady diet of television and movies. Modern television and movies, especially. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3. Jump over there quick. See another one here. This is another one that's used a lot of times, and I'll use it. You know, it's there's a lot of truth in it. Second Timothy chapter three verse four: Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Well, then, bless God, you better not have any pleasure in your life. Is that what it says? No, it says lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Entertainment is not a sin. It only becomes a sin when you start to forsake the things of the Lord. But see, there are brethren that will divide over this stuff. They'll fight and, and war and they'll devour, they will bite and devour one another over issues of liberty. You know, I know guys, you know, I won't have a television in my home and there's no television that will come into my house. Well, there are some very fine DVDs out there. Some really good Christian DVDs and even some secular stuff that's really not that bad. 
Oh, you know, you're of the devil. I won't have nothing to do with you. Okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, be careful what you fight over as a Christian. Now we're going to get a controversial one. What about alcoholic beverages? Turn back in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29. <clears throat> Proverbs 23, verse 29. Okay, your Bible says here, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his collar in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When, I, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Good times. <laughs> it's Miller time. Yeah. Good one. Lay there and throw up and whatever else. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible condemns every type of alcohol. There's no alcohol that is acceptable in God's sight. Is that what the Bible teaches? Proverbs chapter 31 verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. You know you lose control of your mind when you're drinking. Verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Is there a purpose for alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to realize they didn't have morphine or other types of painkillers back in the day. You know, so you get some guy that's laying there and he's dying and he's in pain. You know, give him something. Something to help with his pain. You know, what about somebody who's in, in misery there? And unto those that, that be of heavy hearts. You know, there's a lot of people out there that... that drink you know and and they why because they're trying to forget their problems all right well, they're, trying, There's, they're trying to bury their problems trying to bury them yeah you, when you, you go overboard you're just trying to totally you know forget it, all. it gets it gets worse you know when you get up in the morning and you got a hangover and then your problems <laughs> come right back yeah. so you say well then uh, then you know you can drink alcohol then and it's okay to drink alcohol i didn't say that yeah. and the bible doesn't say that okay what I'm sa simply saying here is, I'm not trying to justify alcohol. My stand is, I won't touch the stuff. Amen. I don't go near it. Right. Why? I don't need it. <laughs> you know? Well, what, what should I mess with that stuff for? <laughs> you know, it's bad association. You know, even if you want to try, you know, I'll drink it at home or something. And, you know, you still got to go buy it. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> I mean, somebody's going to see you getting the, the junk, you know? And it's also, I don't want to lose control of my mind, but, you know, you can make, there's a lot of arguments back and forth here, you know, and, and you could even say, make the arguments, if you go back there to Proverbs chapter 23, the, the symptoms, so to speak, of what happens when you get drunk, those same symptoms can come from other things that are non-alcoholic. We talked about the one time, stay up for about three days with no sleep, yep. you're going to be doing the same thing, you're going to be staggering around, your speech is going to be slurred, and yeah, you're going to be... Yeah, you know, so watch out for the drunkenness thing. But, you know, again, there are brethren in other countries that will have an occasional drink. It's a cultural thing more so with them. Can I condemn them? No, I can't. But see, then Christians will take that. They'll take my words and they'll say, well, then it's okay to drink. I didn't say that. You know, you got to be careful of that stuff. Was the Waldensies you were telling me? Yeah, the Waldensian people, yeah. some of the earliest Christian groups out there, very strong Christians, and they would make wine. That was one of their ways that they made a living. They would make wine. But I guarantee you, if you could have gone back in time, they pretty much were all wiped out, 
in the uh, 1800s, I believe it was, up till you know 1600s especially. Uh, but if you could have gone back, you wouldn't have seen the Waldensians stumbling around the streets, you know, and knocking into each other and things. They weren't drinking for that cause, for that reason. Not for drunkenness. No, not for drunkenness. But again, you have liberty in that area. If you mistakenly drink some alcohol or if you're really, really sick, you know, there's a lot of old remedies out there, old remedies for colds and flus that talk about a little bit of whiskey mixed with this or mixed with that. Oh, it's wrong. It's horrible. Do you take NyQuil? Right. You know? Yeah. NyQuil has, has alcohol in it. A lot of your cold medicines have alcohol in it. See? What is it? It's liberty. Issues of liberty. The Lord's not going to look and say, you took some alcohol there, so you lost your salvation. No. And But, you know... If you go out and you drink and, and you start saying, well, you know, maybe one drink. Well, maybe I'll go down to the pub and, you know, buy some drinks for my friends because they bought some for me. And you start messing around like that, you'll wreck your life. Uh, but we'll finish up here. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. That's where we'll start. And I'm going to tell you right now, the mark of a carnal Christian, the mark of a baby Christian that's immature, is one that will fight over issues of liberty. I will divide over issues of doctrine. Somebody comes in here and they start doing the Sabbath thing and you're sinning because it's a Sunday and you're not keeping the commandments. Get out. I'm not going to give you place. You know, you're not going to come in here and speak and mess people up. You know, everybody here has enough sense to spot that, but I'm not going to let somebody like that speak. You know, my channel on YouTube. Some of these people come in, these heretics, and they start trying to get people taken out with their strange doctrines. I delete them. I delete their comments. And the one guy said, oh, well, I guess you don't believe in the First Amendment. It's like, no, I believe in the First Amendment, just not here. <laughs> you, know? you aren't going to come onto my channel and teach your stupid, strange doctrines. You know, If you come, I'm going to delete you. And if you keep coming, I'm going to block you from my channel. Plain and simple. I'm not going to give you place or, um, you know... Not Whatever. No, not for one hour. Not for one minute. Yeah. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back under this touch-not, taste-not stuff. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now he's talking about their acting like a Jew. You know, if you say, I'm going to become, I'm a Gentile, but I'm going to act, start acting like a Jew, it's not going to profit you anything. It's not going to do a thing for you. Verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law, which is not possible. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Isn't that incredible? I mean, you have Jesus Christ. He came and He paid it all. He died on the cross. He paid for your sins. You don't have to go back under the law. You don't have to keep all the laws and sacrifice animals and everything. And yet the people, they want to go back to that. Why? Well, because we read about it earlier. Because it's weak according to the flesh. You can, you know, get a little bit of self-righteousness in there. That's why they want to go back under the law. Just incredible. And you, you look at any of these messianic, you know, you, you get these people, they're not even Jews. And they're acting like they are Jews. And they're telling you that you're sinning because you're not under the law. You look at them. They are carnal, wicked people. They don't want that righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Verse 5. For we through the, the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither cir circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. Okay, it's faith that comes. God's love that was manifest to man. Uh, which was Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Jesus Christ didn't send these, these Jew people in to try and get you back under the law. Yeah. Verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And you'll see that with people that try to get you back under the law. It starts out, well, you should you should 
you know, be worshiping on Saturday. Oh, and by the way, you have to keep the commandments. Oh, and by the way, let me add something else to it. What, it, what was it? Well, it was a little leaven. It started out, you should just worship on Saturday. And then it goes into so many other areas. And before long, you're rejecting eternal security. You're rejecting the King James Bible because it says Jesus and not Yeshua. You know, you're rejecting all kinds of stuff. You're rejecting the faith of Jesus Christ. You're rejecting the old hymns. You're rejecting this. You're rejecting that. Why? Well, little leaven leavened the whole lump. You've been destroyed. Verse 10. I have confidence, confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. It's interesting because another place Paul said that he would be willing to die for his brethren, his kinsmen, the Jews. And here, here he's saying, these people are so wicked and they're, and they're destroying these Christians. And he says, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. That's how strongly he felt about this. Verse 13, For brethren, we, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now that's a very important verse there. It says there that you're called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't say, well, I got liberty so I can watch an R-rated movie and sit down and drink a beer while I'm watching it. No. You're using your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Anything that you do that starts to mess you up, you know, and starts to ruin your flesh, yeah, you shouldn't be messing with it. Okay, you have to weigh that stuff out. Verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, at some point in time, as you listen to these sermons, I'm going to offend you. I'm going to find some little thing, and it's not even me. You know, people take, they hear some slam or something like that, and they go, oh, he attacked me personally. No, I didn't. I can tell you, I've never preached a sermon with somebody, and I'm saying, I'm going to attack you through the sermon. I see what the Bible says, and I just put it out there, and if it hits you, okay, if it doesn't, all right. But you know what the Bible says back in Psalms? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I had a brother you know, write to me the one time, and I hadn't written in a while because I was busy. And he said, did I offend you with something? And I was like, no. <laughs> you couldn't." And I wrote back and I said, you couldn't offend me if you tried. You know Why? Because he's a brother in Christ, a very tremendous brother, and I love him very dearly. He's not going to offend me, you know. I mean, he can cast some insults at me or whatever. It's not going to offend me. But you see, if I was carnal and immature as a Christian, well, then I'd get offended over issues of liberty. And a lot of Christians do. They hear something. Oh, he said he said that a guy with a shaved face is a, is a sodomite. Oh, oh, you know. I didn't say that, by the way, first. I'm just using it as an example. But... You know, they, they hear some kind of little thing about liberty or some kind of little deal and they get offended and they, I'm out of here, you know. And then they start to bite and devour one another. And they're consumed one of another. You know, don't split a church. Don't split a fellowship over issues of liberty. And, you know, I know of brethren that say things on liberty issues and I disagree very strongly with them. But I'm not going to break fellowship with them. You know, now if they start teaching false doctrine, okay, well, yeah, you know, mark them which cause offenses, offenses and divisions uh, contrary, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Sure. Okay, doctrine, but not liberty. Let's finish up here, verse 16 through 18. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the, the things that ye would, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Notice there in verse 17, uh, it says, These are contrary the one to the other, and so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. When you get into issues of liberty, and you start to do some things that are questionable, 
the Lord will reveal it to you. I'll tell you that. You'll start to feel guilty. You'll start to feel like, ooh, I shouldn't be doing this. The Lord won't just, you know, let you go on and sin and things and, and oh, I didn't know, you know. He'll reveal some stuff to you. Alright? If you seek the Lord and you're, you're growing in the Lord and everything, He'll show you what's right and wrong. But these brethren that come along and they try to get you back under that bondage again of touch not, taste not, handle not, be real careful about that. We are not under the Old Testament law. We are under New Testament liberty. Okay, now in the future it's going to change. It's going to go back. You know, after the rapture, time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have that system more. There's still going to be some liberty, but you're going to have that system of law really starting to come back. And by the millennial kingdom, I think it's going to be very much back. Okay, well, because you're not going to be able to have faith in the millennial kingdom because Jesus Christ will be physically here. So a lot's going to change there. But right now, for this dispensation, you have liberty. Be careful that you don't use your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, and be careful that you do not divide from brethren over issues of liberty. Why? Because that shows a carnal Christian. All right? Divide over doctrine. Absolutely. If a brother will not change doctrinal positions, sure, divide over that. But when it comes to issues of liberty, I'll not fight over it. I will not fight over issues of liberty. It's not going to happen. So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, if you've been offended, <laughs> well, you know, if it's doctrinal, okay, you know. Uh, sometimes I've said things, I'll just put this out there. Sometimes I've said things, I know I listen to some of my older messages and I kind of go, and maybe I could have been a little easier on that or whatever. Okay. If, you know, if you know me, you know that I, I love Christians, you know, and I'm trying to get the truth out. Sometimes a little, I'm a little abrasive, whatever. Get over it, <laughs> you know. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Keep that in mind. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.